Just lost the clamp here when I can. Amen. She had a small water yesterday. She was like a small one. <laughs> Don't understand you guys get across to the scripture today. And it's Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. And may I say good morning to our friends online today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And good morning to the saints of God in the house. Thank you for being with us today as well. Amen. Right, so the scripture says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I was still into his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew, withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, if you being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So Father, we thank you for your word this morning. For your word is be blessed. We thank you, God, as we, we listen to your word today. God, that you will teach us some things that you want us to know, Father. Our Lord, may I increase that you may increase, Father God, and may I speak as the oracle of you. So that in God we can learn what you're saying from your word this morning. So, Lord, again, I thank you so much for today. Yes, thank Lord. you for your people. Thank you for those in the house. Thank you for those online. And Lord, thank you. As always, you're in our midst and in our presence. Yes, so I give you thanks, my Father. In Jesus' name, my friend. Amen. 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 Give somebody a high five and you will sit down after that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, again, good morning once again. And also, may I say good morning? Uh, congratulations to our. Uh, Baptismal uh, candidates this morning. I will introduce them later on. Not yet. Okay? So they still have some time to get themselves together. <laughs> they have to say something to the congregation this morning. Yes. So I'm, I'm giving them the entire service to prepare their minds, their emotions, and stop shaking. So, so that they can see something to the world. And of course, may I say thank you to everyone who came on yesterday, yes. all of our youngsters, yes. our adults who came on yesterday. Thank you very much uh, for being a part of our first, and not the last, our first baptism yes. of Hope in the World Center. That was an auspicious occasion, really yes, was. And then that was our first baptism service. And of course, baptism, so that was fantastic. And the pool was just right. I thought the freezing cold, but it was good. Yeah. yeah, we were, you know, we got out there early and we thank God for that. And uh, we, we will have to look at Victory Heights again at another location. Uh, that place looks cool for now, so we can try something there for a while, I suppose. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's get into the word today. All right. Uh, again, Galatians 2 11 and 14. And we are talking about today. When hypocrisy corrupts theology. Again, when hypocrisy corrupts theology. And we have noted in the scripture that Paul, here writing to the Galatians, 
is relating to them an incident which occurred where the Jews who came from the church in Jerusalem, who were very religious people, they came and where they came to, Peter was there. But Peter, however, was conversing with the Gentiles as he usually does. But when these people came from, it says they came from James, meaning they came from Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the head church. When they came from there, Peter began to act funny. Yeah? As we see, he started acting funny. <laughs> so Peter started acting strange. And Paul said, I withstood him to his face. In other words, I called him on face hypocrisy. He says, if all this time you're hanging out with Gentiles, or all of a sudden they would strange because these Jews have just arrived. What is going on here? And here's a quotation. When prejudice is found in those who confess the name of Christ, it is always accompanied by hypocrisy. A writer whose name was Flannery O'Connor, he wrote a short story, and this is what it said. A lady, Mrs. Turpin, was in a doctor's waiting room. What should we condemn with condescension those around her? She sees poor white people, black people, and ugly people. With a momentous sigh of relief, she thanks God that he has spared her from these conditions. Her prayer is, her prayer is reminiscent of this prayer in Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Jesus spoke a parable to the to some, and he says, to those who trust in themselves that you are righteous and despise others. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other tax collector, who they were called a sinner. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax letter standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be Exalted. This is a lesson to the people of God. Because as Christians, we tend to become very condescending to other people. There are Christians who feel that because I was never found in adultery, I was never found in fornication, and the sins of the life. I am better than those who were in those areas and have not come to Christ. You behave like that. Very condescending to other people. We have the Pharisees, who are the religious elite. And in our churches, you will observe that we do, in fact, have religious elite people in the church. Elitists, people feel that they are better than other people, they are over other people, and therefore, they, they don't, they're not in the kind of sin that they are in. So we have to be very careful to observe and to pay attention to our own selves and to what we are doing. Paul here stated carefully, he says he opposed Peter because before the Jews came, and, and, not, and for quite some time, he would hang out with the Gentiles. He would eat their food as well. Maybe not the pork, I suppose, but he would eat their food. But then when these people came from, from Jerusalem, when these Judaizers, as they call them, they came from there, he began to pull away himself from the Gentiles. Because why? He didn't want anybody to talk about it. Isn't that where we behave sometimes? 
you know, in the church, unfortunately, there is prejudice. There is some prejudice in the church. And let's define what prejudice means. One, it is a preconceived judgment or opinion. Two, an adverse opinion or learning or leaning rather without a just ground or before sufficient knowledge. It is also an irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual, a group, a race, or their supposed characteristics. And many times prejudice has no rationale. Because why? It is irrational. There is nothing that says to me, why should you be prejudiced? In our own country, why are we prejudiced against another? Why is a person of African descent prejudiced against a person of East Indian descent? Why is that? There is no reason for those things. It is irrational. It is based on something you were, you were told that became some kind of truth for you all of a sudden, but has no basis in anything. Okay, like this, for instance, people say, they might tell you, why, you ask somebody, why you don't like this person? What happened to you on this person? And sometimes they, they can't give you a reason. But you discover their mother didn't like that person's mother. Their grandmother didn't like that grandmother as well. Their great-great-grandmother didn't like that great-great-grandmother. And it continues. You ask the question, why the prejudice? Well, we just don't like them. Quiet. No one knows. And that's the thing. Within the body of Christ, there is no basis for prejudice. Amen? None whatsoever. There is no basis for that. But what Paul was pointing out here is that there were some Jews that felt that the Gentiles could not be saved unless they followed the tenets of the law. Unless they circumcised their boy children. Unless they ate kosher food. Unless they, they become pious as they were. And then they were also concerned because they discovered that the Holy Ghost fell upon the Gentiles. Whereas many thought that the Holy Ghost would fall upon the Jews because they are God's designated persons. But they, they realized, wait not, but the Gentiles getting saved. The Holy Ghost is on them. That can't be right. They need to do something to look like us. Isn't that how we behave sometimes in the church? We, in the church sometimes, we try to have everybody look the same. So, the pastor and his minions look the same. If he wears a three-piece suit, all his male minions wear three-piece suits too, just like him. If his wife is in a certain kind of clothing, we see all our followers in the same kind of clothing. Minions. You remember that movie, Minions? You know that talk, right? That's how they behave. They don't have their own opinions. They don't form anything in their minds. And therefore, the prejudices of the pastors transfer to them. Many of you would have noticed, you were in different churches. Somebody follows you. The pastor follows you too. Or the pastor like this person, the minions don't like them too. Have you seen that? Yes. Tell me if I remember right. We have seen that, haven't we? And that is fundamentally wrong. That is not what the scripture talks about. And that is not what the church is about. The church cannot practice prejudice. The church cannot practice uh, ostracizing people. Because of somebody's perceived prejudice against another for whatever reason. People are prejudiced because one has money, one doesn't. 
One has education, one doesn't. One has a nice house, one doesn't. And people are prejudiced for all of these reasons. And Paul is saying here that Peter, remember Peter had a vision? He was at uh, the house of, I think, Simon the Tanner, he was. And he fell, in, he fell into a sleep, and then he got a vision. He saw the sheep comes down from heaven. On it contains all of the fruit groups that they are not to eat. And then a voice says to Peter, kill and eat. And then Peter says, but no, nothing unclean has gone to my mouth. Then the word of God says, nothing I created is unclean. That was to tell him. Because God was sending him to the Gentile person, Cornelius. And Jews felt that Gentiles were unclean because they didn't practice their rituals and so on. But God is saying to Peter, remove your prejudice. And he's saying to Christians today, remove your prejudice. Yes. Why are we so prejudicial against each other? There is no reason or basis for that. Now, every ethnic group has their own quirks and whatever else it might be, and things are made of who they are. But it does not mean that we should be prejudicial against each other. Because when we come to the house of God, the Bible says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, meaning when we come to God, we are all equalized, we are all one in Christ. Amen. 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 God does not see ethnic groups. He sees people, whether they are sinners or whether they are saints. That is who God sees. As a matter of fact, it may be argued that we have different ethnic groups because of the incident at the Tower of Babel. Because you recall at the Tower of Babel, they decided where, they, where God told Noah's children, they need to go and populate the earth. But these descendants, children, grandchildren, and so on, decided, no, we want to stay here, but we're going to build a tower to get to heaven so we can be God ourselves. The Bible says that God came down and he confused their language. And from there, we can trace so that language, all languages has one, has, has one origin. So everything came from there. And then because of that now, and they were dispersed to different parts of the world, ethnicities developed because yeah. of that. So wherever they went, uh, as they begin to populate, people developed uh, traits that would help them to live in those environments and so on. So therefore, ethnic groups came out of that particular area. But God does not see that. God sees the human race. Amen? There was one race, it's called a human race. That's what God sees. God does not have prejudice in that sense that we know prejudice to be. Amen? Amen. And prejudice is a human problem. It is not a God problem. No. It's a human problem. Because the Bible records that God is no respecter of persons. He will use a peasant. He will use a child. He will use a vagrant. He used a donkey and all yes. to talk to a prophet. The Bible says, the ass spoke to him. That's what the thing says. Man, Jack Ashram. That's what it says. Eh? So that is that a donkey. Is. So picture that in your mind. When he calls somebody that, what are you telling him? So the thing, the donkey spoke to a prophet. God is anybody or anything or any, or any vessel to speak to his people, to make them listen. He will, he said, he will make your enemies be at peace with you. Yes, amen. Your enemy will bless you, and they don't know why. Yeah. You see, God is not a God of prejudice. But we as a people, we develop prejudice at times because of certain uh, ideas in our minds and become prejudicial towards other people. When I was growing up, of course, in Tobago, it is predominantly African. But growing up there, there was never any thought of somebody 
is less than I am, or somebody's greater than I am because of a different ethnic makeup and so That was not a part of my psyche. And of course, understanding my family tree now. Because in my family tree, we have Scottish people, we have Spanish people, we have uh, people from East, from, uh, from India, because my paternal grandmother came on the Fata Razak. My mother's, my father's mother. She came from India. She was uh, Indian, Indian. She came from there. So when I looked at my family tree, I said, Lord, if I become prejudicial, I kill my own self. <laughs> because I straddle all the races. And I thank God for that. Because even if I wanted to be, I can't. Because I straddle them all. And thus, on, on my, my, my wife's side as well, to be the same situation. So our children now are more than Kalalu. <laughs> it's Baji, cook up, or your dung, your whole works. That's what we are. <laughs> right? So therefore, when I, when I am not growing up in the church now, I, I begun to see in certain churches that kind of racial prejudice in the church eh, is not in the church. I begun to see that kind of racial prejudice. And I couldn't understand why that is. And that is from both sides, eh? not from one side, that's on both sides, along the cross the board. I began to see that kind of racial prejudice. And I asked myself this question. Why are we behaving like that? Because I know incidentally, uh, when I was at secondary school, we had uh, about one or two transfers of Trinidad, and they turned out to be Indian people. But when they came to school, I am the first person they all befriended. Because when they came to school, our schools in Tobago, they did not know so much again. But the schools were predominantly African in school. So that when they came to school, some of them, I guess, were a bit out of place, but Trinidad really mixed up. So they saw, you know. But when they came to school, they were kind of like, uh, you know, a building a haystack. But they befriended me. And I always, I always had that, uh, uh, you know, that friendness towards other people of, of, of other races. You know, at one time we had a guy in school. He was the only white guy in school. <laughs> he was a tall strapping fellow. He's not a priest, actually. He was the only white guy in school. He said, who's this white guy in school? When I talked to him, you know? And we realized, and so people developed, uh, you know, people tend to develop a uh, certain kind of racial uh, and discrimination that the church must not ever tolerate. We must never be a part of that because the church is a melting pot of all races in the entire world, right? The church is what we call a crucible. A crucible is a melting pot. It is a melting pot of all racial denominations. And everybody should feel a part of the house of God and the kingdom of God. Because here now, when we go to heaven, you might see races you never saw before. Yes. And you're kind of disappointed because we're now all living here. <laughs> That kind of thing. Because in heaven has every possible ethnic makeup in the world. You will see creatures in heaven that you cannot describe. John tried to describe them. The thing that a face of a, a lion, he had a face in the back of his head. Something was in a wheel, in the middle of a wheel. You can't describe those things you see. So in heaven, we have we will find that there are different races there. But the thing is. We have to learn to live together here on God's green earth within the body of Christ. So in the body of Christ, there is no place for those prejudicial behaviors. So Paul is calling on Peter for his prejudice against the Gentiles now because some people came from, from Jerusalem who are very devout Jews or religious people and so on and, and find that Jews and Gentiles should not mingle together, Right? And, but then you discover in the first century church, 
Many Jews worshipped with their Gentile brothers on Sunday, and then vice versa, Gentile brothers worship with their, with their Jewish brothers on Saturday. That happened. So there was that kind of camaraderie, that kind of love uh, that developed. But then people, they, some they call them Judaizers, they who, are, who hold uh, uh, strict um, ideas on the law, what should be observed, they couldn't face the fact that Jews and Gentiles were equal. They needed them to be unequal. They needed to have the Jews above and the Gentiles below. Yeah. But the blood of Jesus equalized yeah. everybody. That's right. Amen. 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 He equalized everybody. That's the thing. That's why we come to church. In the church, we're not to see people based on their professions in the world. We see them based on the call of God on their lives in the body of Christ. Yeah. That's what it is. Right? We don't knock anybody's profession. But in the church, that doesn't really matter. What matters in here is what you're ready to do in the house of God. Amen. And there's where you're going to fit. Sometimes in, in, in the church, we put people as heads of division, of heads of areas because they have a big post in, in the world somewhere. Mm. Somebody's a, a big manager somewhere, so you put them to manage, uh, you put them to run Sunday school, and they make a mess of the entire thing. Yeah. They mock up the whole thing. Because that is not where they call it. That is not where they call it. They could do something else. Maybe they could assist in church administration. Yeah. Right? But their call is not for Sunday school. And in church, we have a set of square pegs and wrong walls. <laughs> because we're not, we not seen anointing. we see seen position. And many times in church, we try to lie on people because we're trying to get favor in the world. The Bible says favor comes from heaven. Amen. It doesn't come from anybody else. When we're trying to line up ourselves and get favor with people in the world, we will compromise our belief systems. So true. It will be compromised. You see, when they start to look at people because they wanted to help in the church, yeah. they're going to compromise. And I'm not going down that road. If you want to help, fine. Of your own volition, I ain't asking them for nothing. Because when I ask some of them, they want a pong and a pong. And I don't have any of those things to give them. Not even one cent. So, in the church, we want to have a different perspective, a different view of things. But too often, the view in the church is the same as in the world. And you wonder why nobody gets in saved. Because the church looking just like the world. So what do you mean the world for? Because I still turn down. Because when you're out in the world, people are bickering, they backstabbing, they behave like crabs in a barrel and so on. And then they come to church, then they discover, but it's the same thing here. Because I stay out here. Eat, drink, and enjoy myself, don't be sorry. Because if I say I get saved and I come here and the same thing going on, then what's the point of church? And that is what is going on today. People are, are killing themselves to do evangelism, to, to, to bring, to, to build the numbers of the church. But when people come to the church, they discover what is the same nonsense going on inside here. They are trying to run away from, from the world. I am meeting here. I am meeting prejudice in the church. Favoritism in the church. Then what am I doing here? What are coming here for? You see, if we say that we serve in God and we name the name of Jesus, then we have to be different. We cannot be the same. And that is what Paul was vexing Peter for. Peter, you are seeing your apostle. You are no better by your behaving so. You have to put those Judaizers in their place. Yeah. Hey, stop all your prejudice. That is foolishness. These are people of God as well, so stop the nonsense. Behave yourself. But in church, we will say that to them. Pray for them. God will keep them. Go <laughs> slap them. They need to wake up. Well, if you're sleeping, they will just need <laughs> They need to wake up and stop behaving like that. You see, in church, we adopt this kind of softness. Yeah? Everybody tip to know other people. Well, they you know you can't tell them that. They'll feel offended. <laughs> Listen, 
If you're offended by the Bible, then buy this time Bible instead. That will help you. Because if the word of God offends you, go and buy the word of Satan in the right letter. Because listen, they have a Satan Bible. They have one. When the Bible says, turn your cheek, that says, slap them on one time. <laughs> That's what that one says. It says, slap them on theirs. Some people don't want to deal with their prejudices in the church. Right? They come with their prejudices in the house of God. This is not the place for that. When you come to the house of God, you must feel that you belong to a family. So that if your family is under pressure, when they come here, you don't want to leave because this is your family. That's right. Yes, we know in families there may be squabbles. But in the house of God, there's a remedy to deal with squabbles. It's called love. The Bible says that perfect love casts on all fear. And that love covers a multitude of sins. Everybody is required to love. Don't come and say, the church has no love, and you will trade no love. Love is reciprocal. You have to show to receive. If you don't show love, you might get none because people can't afraid of you. They might step back. Well, all right, I ain't know what to do with you. Because there are some people. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> One, two, three. Yes. <clears throat> right. There are some people. <laughs> you don't know how to hug them. That's physicality. <laughs> Even that's a problem too. Some people are very standoffish. But these are the same people who say the church has no love. You come to church, they try to hug you, you stand back so. They try to shake your hand, they shut out a little piece like that. And then they say the church has no love. If you're afraid, come and stay in your house. Be a hermit if you want them. Live in your house. Right? But people need to reciprocate the things that they receive in the house of God. Now, God is a God of love. We have to love God to it. And they show God love by worshiping him and so on. And by, a, 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 by adhering to his commandments and so on. That's how you should love God. But many of us don't do that. So we, we say we love God, but we don't keep his commandments. We say we love God, but we don't show love to anybody. So how can we love God? Because God is love. When Jesus was on the earth, he showed you how to love. The Bible always recorded whenever he saw money to use a move with compassion. Yeah. He was always moved with compassion for people when he saw them, especially when they were hungry. He says, Hey, you have any food for these people? He said, Lord, all we have is you know find those fishes now. We have you know it. He says, Bring it from me, I'll pray. And when he prayed, the Bible says it fed five thousand men besides women and children. And that more meaning. So picture that. Let's say <clears throat> every man has a wife and a child. That is 5, 10, 15,000 people. And it could have been probably more. I mean, 20,000 plus. Because some might have five or six children. Because in those days, they made plenty of children. Well, the control was kind of not around them. Yeah. They had no TV, you know, to entertain your time. So, hey, come there, we go. That was the entertainment, you know. So there's a possibility they might have been 20,000 or 25 or 30,000 people sitting there, right? So he always fed the people. So according to this quotation, it is difficult, or this article rather, it is difficult to imagine how hard it was for many Jews, God's chosen people, to accept that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, <clears throat> Slave nor free, uh, male or female, and that's Galatians 3 or 28. Now, some false teachers, they would they call them Judaizers, found this teaching impossible to swallow and thought that a Gentile must adopt the customs of the Jewish people before embracing Christianity. For a time, these customs had their place in salvation history. They were commanded by God to set apart the Jewish people uh, to be holy and so on. 
But th these laws were fulfilled uh, in Christ. So now holiness is not no longer following what you would eat, but in whom you believed. And as Paul wrote, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 2 and 16. So there were some Jews that felt that the Gentiles could not be Christians unless they adhere to the laws of the Jewish people. But the Bible says you are justified by faith, not justified by the law. Right? That's what he told us. But some still felt that the Jews, or the, the Gentiles rather, should be, a, should continue, or rather should, should uh, uphold the law to be Christian. And Paul, the place is wrong, listen to me. Our forefathers could not take that yoke upon, they couldn't keep that yoke. Why you want to put that yoke in Gentiles? The only thing that is there is for them to, to abstain from idolatry, yeah. idolatry, idolatry, abstain from things sacrificed to idols, eating those things, abstain from eating blood and so on, but nothing else besides those things. Yeah. So therefore, there should be no prejudice between a Jew and a Gentile. Now in today's world, we now have the reverse. We have now Gentiles that are prejudiced against the Jews. So we have the reverse now. Where now they see Israel as, as a, a thorn in their side to be destroyed, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> However, just the other day, the Moroccan government has gone to Israel to try to establish an embassy there. So there are some Muslim nations that want to establish ties with Israel. They know it echoes the last desert. And this, of course, is part of the Abraham Accords that former President Trump was able to put in place. That certain, so some of these Muslim nations are beginning to sign peace treaties with Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Which is most interesting. Yeah. Well, except Iran, of course, because Iran hit them totally. Yeah. Iran won them dead. And now, because those other nations are saying those things, Iran is going to get more angry. Because now, their Muslim brothers want to be at peace with the Jewish people. Yeah. You want to know why? Because you realize they can't topple Israel so easily. Israel will fight back and deal with and destroy if they want to. Because Israel has a very serious arsenal. They know people don't know this, but Israel's military is serious. Yes, They're it deadly. Yeah. Right? There are some serious missiles that will destroy them. And some of them get afraid of those things. Eh? Right? But now we have the Gentiles prejudice, prejudice against the Jews. And now, today, where the Christian is concerned, we have to show the Jewish people the love that Christ has in us, that we love them too. They have to see that so they will understand. Because many of them, eh, many of the Jews right now, Orthodox Jews, don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. They don't believe that. Eh? Yeah. Up to now, many of them don't believe that, that he is the Messiah, or that he came as a matter of fact. <clears throat> Excuse me. They don't believe that. So we who are the people of who we are Christians, we have to show them the love that we have and stretch that love towards them so that they see the love of God in us and come to know the true living God and the Messiah. Amen? Amen. Show them that. So there is no prejudice for, sorry, there is no place for prejudice in the church. So Paul sent to Peter for retreating from his bedrock Christian truth. You see, for a time, Peter lived as a Gentile, not like a Jew, and that he ate non-kosher food with his Gentiles brothers in Christ. Now, that shows reconciliation. Yes. Amen? Yes. That a Jew and a Gentile can sit together and eat and commute together because why? The love of Christ is in them. But Peter lost sight of that when these Jews came. Why? Because they are respecting our persons. You felt that these people, you don't want them to, to criticize you now, to make you feel funny. Listen, as a Christian, eh, many times you have to stand up by yourself for what you know is right. Sometimes the repairs in the church will not stand with you. Sometimes you discover 
People in church have some weird ideas. Man. They have some weird concepts. Man. They don't understand some basic things in life. Man. You, you get that. And I got that so often. I was thrown away sometimes with those kinds of things. Remember one time as a young Christian, I said to somebody, this, uh, this actually was a pastor's wife, actually. I said, you know, death and life is in a pro of the tongue. Careful what you say. She rebuked me for saying that. And that is the word of God. I am like, are you nuts? You are pastors when you tell me that. You have got to be kidding. And you realize they, they, have an, they have some misconceptions in their minds about the word of God. Listen. People bring curses on themselves by what they say, you know. Because why? You don't understand. When the Bible says, death and life in the poor of the tongue, that is the absolute truth. Why is that? Because we are made in image and likeness of God. Yes. So that the same way God can speak a thing into being, we could do the same too. That's right. Because he gave us that innate ability as well. So when you say it to yourself, you will die in two years. You might die in two years. And people bring curses on themselves. They, they bring curses on themselves. They say what? They will never get any money. They'll be poor. And they remain poor. And then they, they get back to God. But you said you'll be stay poor. Death and life is in a poor of the tongue. You have to be careful what you say. Or you speak to yourself. Or what you speak into your life. You cannot speak negatively into your life. You can't speak those things. Because your tongue has power. And as a Christian... When you speak something, it has the weight of heaven behind it. Amen. Amen. But be careful. So if you speak negatively, heaven has to stand back and leave that good with us to go. You have to repent of that and curse that good and kill us in Jesus' name. Right? But when you speak negatively, heaven stands back. They have to leave you and leave that good to where it has to go. Because the principle is if you speak it, heaven can't stop it. Whether it's negative or positive, heaven can't stop it because you spoke the word. As a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the body of Christ, you can speak the word. right? He says, where two or three guys get, he's the midst of them. And he says, if you agree as touching anything, it shall be. Our words have life and power. Be careful we use those words. Yes? So Paul censored Peter because of his prejudice. So by Peter um, capitulating to these Judaizers, he was given credibility to the heresies and in essence was agreeing to Gentiles living as Jews. And that could not be the case. Right? So that faith in Christ Jesus was no longer enough. But the works of the law became the requirement to be saved. And that is not true. Because if the law could have saved the people, Christ would not have had to die on the cross. So the law couldn't save anybody. The Bible says what the Lord did was it, it magnified sin. So the Lord, showed, the Lord showed you your sin. And then he said, no, the law was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. In other words, the law showed you your sin. And the law also showed you, listen to me, in doing these ritual things by, by killing the bulls and the goats, that blood has been shed. Someday, a one, a lamb, a sacrificial lamb will come once and for all and shed his blood that will wash away all of our sins. You see, all of the rituals that were there were pointing towards Jesus Christ, the one true sacrificial lamb, so that the law could not save anybody. And that is what the Jews had to understand. And many of them believed in the law. They refused to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They believed in the law. But the law could not save you and will not save you. Only the blood of Jesus could save you. Amen? That saves you, that was for your sins. So that we don't have to go kill bulls and goats again for that reason in particular. Although, 
there's a scripture that points out in the in the time of the millennium, when the temple is up, there would still be some slaughtering of animals. And that we'll discuss with the revelation again. But that is to remember for them to remember what God would have done for them. Remember where they came from. There's even the idea that there'll be uh I think as I talked about, there will be a, a street or a road, a passageway through well, kind of like above hell in a sense, going to the temple. So that those who are on the earth are saved will see those down there and remember and understand why they are there. So that because, because in the millennium, there is no sin. Well, there is no devil. So it tempts you to sin. But people are still in a sinful body. But by in passing through there, they will see hell. And they will understand, if you don't serve God, that is where you're going to go. But at last, Revelation reads, many of them still rebel against God and went their own way. Right? But he put a uh, prejudice has no place in the house of God. All right? So, if prejudice and hypocrisy could enter the Apostle Peter's ministry, believers today should not assume that they are impervious to such a fall. Because if Peter, one of the senior apostles who walked with Jesus, could falter in that way, we are not in you. Because we didn't see what they saw. But yet still, he fought in that regard. Right? So that when Christians use unbiblical standards to marginalize or shun their brothers and sisters, they join the Galatians in a prejudice and thereby crowd the gospel. For some churches, it may be as simple as an unofficial dress code, whereby men with or without ties are not taken seriously. They look down on those who don't use the King James Version of the Bible. Others, if we enhance in prayer or not, or cherishing prophecy charts or not, and one becomes an outsider. Listen, very simple things create prejudice in the church. Very simple. They know to dress school. Dress school is one of those things that creates a problem in the church. Remember the place I was? Somebody was telling me, you know, the pastor wears suits, why don't I wear suits too? I said, I don't want to. If I want to, I will, but I don't want to. When I decided to, I did, but I don't want to. I'm not doing it because someone else did it. That is not my thing. And they don't live a life like that. Because you do it, I do it too. So if you go ahead, I go ahead too. I don't know. I don't know about you. Go by yourself. And, and that's the thing in the church. So because leaders do a certain thing, I must do it too. What if they think they do this wrong? By many different standards. People don't see that. We are doing it well, like, like you know, we need to do it too. Leaders not talking to people, they follow the same thing. So you leave our church. Everybody not listening. Yeah. The pastor don't to the dog on your own. Exactly. The dog barking and, and watching your phone. <laughs> they they see you, they pass it straight. Because he or she not talking to you. But do they feed you? Do they pay your bills? Don't you have to make a choice for yourself in your own mind what to do? Then why are people leaving on a wrong road? Because it's the pastor say so. If the pastor wrong, the pastor wrong. If I'm wrong, I am wrong. I have to depend for being wrong. I can't tell you. Okay, in our congregation, we have some folks who have left the congregation. Some not so good. Well, most of the terrible. They have gone. In, they left in a terrible way that is. They have gone. Right? But did I tell you, don't talk to them when you see them? Did I tell you that? And I will never tell you that. But that is wrong. You have your mind to decide. If you don't want to, that is your choice. But I will not tell you. See them, don't talk to them. No, no, no. We don't do those things. 
We don't behave like that in that kind of fashion. Because that says we are creating prejudice in person's minds. And we're making them become prejudicial. Maybe if you see them and talk to them, you could witness to them again yeah. and cause them to turn themselves around. That's right. Amen. I probably couldn't do it for them, but maybe you could. Because you may have a better rapport with them at a certain level. So you could I say, oh, yeah, you know, they talk to them and they might turn, they might change their mentality. But when we when we create that environment where if someone needs a church, don't talk to them again. We talk to them so nicely. What are we doing? What are we propagating in the house of God and in the body of Christ? Prejudice, wickedness as evil. We don't do things like that. Because many people would have left and gone to a different church. But they go to another part of the vineyard. All of some bonus and church were kind of fit open in our center. <laughs> Why must I be angry if you leave and go on somewhere else? I will say to you, make sure I'm going to house of God. I saw someone that said, yeah, you go in the church, they say, yes, it's good. Stay in your son God. Do not go somewhere and go crazy. Go to your son God. Maybe you couldn't make it here. That's how it is sometimes. Because every church has their followers that God was sent to that church. But there are some that can't make it at all. And some just have bad mind, basically. Anywhere they go, the same bad mind they have. Those are those kind of people. But the point is, when you come to the house of God, if you leave the thing, I must never say to you, and preach on top here about people and all your gone. Do this and that and leave your past in the cold. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's just craziness. Madness. There are so many things to talk about inside here. <laughs> Why am I talking about the leave church and what they leave the church, what they saw the thing and what they be even bad? What, 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 what is that? That is crazy. There is nothing in there that tells you live for Jesus. What it tells you is live for me. <laughs> no, no, no. Live for Jesus. So we create these little prejudicial things in the church. And people begin to feel as though they, or rather, we create sex in the church then. So there's one sect on this side, there's one sect on the other side. And they decide that we don't care where they go. They just hang around somewhere. They just send chips. They just hang around. They really care. They just so. They just rebel against every single thing that's been crazy and so on. So we have no sex in the church. That should never be the case in the house of God. We don't, we don't sectorize the church. Right? We don't create, uh, um, we don't exercise one group and then like one group. And we don't do that. And listen, this happens in too many of our churches, you know? It really does. In too many of us, we see this is going on. You know, as a young person coming up in the house of God, at some point I knew that God had called me to, to minister his word as well. But, okay, matter of fact, when I was younger in church as a boy, people told my mother, Your son will preach the gospel. I am. Preach what? Call the pastor to the poor. That is not me. I'm not going there at all. Because every time I say a pastor, I'm going to rice. I'm not in that. Because I that, as a child, that's my concept in my mind, as I'm seeing. You're in church, you're seeing pastors preaching. But they, they're not living properly. They're not, they can't afford, they can't afford my shoes. So, but this doesn't make sense. I don't get preacher at all. That wasn't me. I'm not doing that because I only get, get poor ones so. But I knew all along the things of God. And of course, you know, my career I'm working on so on. God began to move in me. And listen, he's calling me. And I understood now growing up and everything and so on. That, hey, you need to work. That is important. You need to work. Yes. Right? I think if some pastors went to work, they might behave better. Because they would catch this at work. Understand? Don't behave so. Work for your own money. When you work for your own money, it's yours. Nobody can tell anything. It's your money. If you want a certain lifestyle, work for your own money and practice your own lifestyle. Not everybody, but for some people. So, understanding that God has called you and of being in churches now, 
and you, you know that God has called you to ministry. You, you hoped that the people you were under, well, they recognized it too well, but you hoped that they would be kind enough to release you into your own ministry with kindness. On the contrary, they despise their nothing in their life. And so they kick you out and out you. And they didn't care to bless you and release it in ministry. I pondered that for a long time. I said, Lord, why is it like that? Because that is not what the Bible taught us. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, I'm releasing you. And he said to them, listen, greater works than these shall ye do. He released his disciples to go and work miracles. He had to hold it to himself and try to dominate them and make them feel less than who they are. And if God called you, that means you're coming against the ministry. But I'm going to tell you. They make you feel as though because God has called you, you're, you're coming against the ministry. I don't respect the past anymore. But God calls people out of the church. And what we as ministers are supposed to do is to have to nurture you, to teach you, and then release you to what God has called you to do. Because everybody would not sit in the congregation and be here. Some are called to go out and go there to go outside there. Some are called to other parts of the vineyard to raise a church and do ministry. But when we behave as though we have a patent on the people, we have a patent on your anointing, that you only go when I tell you to go, not when God said to go. But now, when God said to go, I went. Because if I did not go, God will hold me accountable for not going. We record the incident of the prophet in the Old Testament. I think it's King's in it. And the old, the old prophet tells the young prophet, don't do what God told him to do. The young prophet went, he was eating that line or based on that he was. But he listened to the old prophet because he's the old prophet. He figured he um, had more knowledge. But when God tells you X, nobody, don't let anybody turn you back from that. We don't know who they are. Don't turn back from that. So we have to learn from the ministry. With great uncertainty. Because there's nobody back in us already. Except God, of course. Right? Everybody in you has passed over the case by me. Then it's, it's like a spit you out of the boat and throw you away. <laughs> because why? God called you. God didn't call you alone. He called other people too. And God called me alone. He called other people too. And some may come here. That God wants to be neutral here and then released thereafter. I don't understand that. I cannot become prejudicial. I want to hold it to myself because I find it should go to. And that's what happens in the church. That kind of prejudice develops. Listen, as a minister of the gospel, we cannot be jealous of what we have grown up with the children. That God wants to anoint from the children. We cannot be jealous. As a matter of fact, they will complement the ministry. So true. Right. Even if they have to go to do what, what God called them to do, they go out as a branch from here. Yes. Yeah? They knew that they covered from here. And they're going to what God called them to do understand that they have somebody backing them all the way. Right? And that is where they're supposed to be. But when they launch out, everybody just turned their back on you. Passing this away for years, just, just turn it back on you and leave you on the call for yourself. As if you're not supposed to go out there and do what we call it to do. I mean, come on now. Is that what the church comes down to? No, not supposed to. Is that, that's how we have to behave? <clears throat> Excuse me. We have to stop that prejudice in the church. So some Christians say, <laughs> I am not prejudicial. Well, at the same time, giving aid and comfort to those who do, in fact, practice discrimination or the sorts of heresies. <clears throat> so some of us say, look, we're not prejudicial, but we don't possess who are. And we allow them a, a hearing and we back them up on what they're saying and we'll correct them. So therefore, 
we become prejudicial too. And we have to watch that. Because in the church, when that develops, it creates divisions within the church structure. And that is why in so many churches, it doesn't feel like a family structure. But it feels like a divided family one. Because there's such a great division. It should not be like that. And it ought not to be like that. The church is not to be divided. You see, a house divided against us shall not stand. We cannot be divided. We cannot allow devices in the church. When those things enter, the church loses her power. She loses her authority. Because you can't have power and authority if there's division in the ranks in the church. If we as leaders, because we have leaders in the church, so if, if we, as, as the management team of the church, we have to create an environment where everybody is, everybody feels love. Everybody feels a part of the ministry. We, they, must, they, they, have, they must not feel as though they are second-class citizens. And so therefore, as leaders, we create the temple for the church. We create the environment for the church. We create the status quo for the church, as it were to be. So that if we, if we create the environment where everybody feels as though, uh, we behave as though we are superior to the congregation, then what's going to develop is you're going to have what is called inferiority complexes in the church. Because people begin to feel inferior to leadership. And they're going to try all sorts of things to get in favor with leadership. They're going to mash over their brothers and sisters because they want to be in favor with the leadership. Because they're feeling inferior. Because why? That environment has been created. We must never create those kind of environments. Because Jesus Christ never created that environment at all. In his environment, he loved his disciples. Man, he loved all of them. But after he gave a certain speech, seven till left. And he said to the twelve, so are you leaving me as well? He said, no, you have a bread of life. We don't go anywhere. Jesus felt hurt because he was instructing them on how to live. But some people don't want those kinds of instructions. They rather, they rather the um the hype in church and the fun and games and the the gospel is coming to sing in church and you know and they, they wave their flag, wave it, wave it, yeah. That is what we want. Somebody jump on the place and but he feels good about that. But that is not what church is about. We come in church to learn, and we have to grow in that. You have to accept the teachings and then learn from that. And then apply that to your life and grow from there. Because that's the only way you will become a successful Christian. I say that loosely. Meaning, you have to apply the word of God to your life and live according to that and learn from those things. And of course, learn from your errors. That is important to me. All right? So, in the house of God, hypocrisy corrupts our theology. When we become prejudicial and our theology changes to suit the prejudice that we have. In some places where you go to, their, their prejudice, or rather, their theology is influenced by, by their prejudice. Back in the 1900s, or the 19th century rather, when slavery was big and bold, many of the church, because of their prejudice against the slaves, their theology was developed around that prejudice. And therefore, people who were slaves were less than human. So therefore, they had no place among people in the church. So that their theology was influenced by their prejudice. In modern times, 
when we come to some churches now, we have a, we have a situation where women are kept in the background because their theology says women are not to minister the gospel, they're not to be seen, not to be heard, so that the theory, the prejudice now, or the theory, theology, is influenced by their own prejudice. So that in some of those churches, women can't say a word. They can't even say boo. What are you saying before? What's up? They can't even say that. Because why? Their theology is influenced by their prejudice. Right? And, and we have other cases where we have... I read the last one book that I had there, where there is this kind of feeling where there is superiority among certain leaders, and therefore they must be addressed by their full titles. Because you are mere mortal, you can't talk to me. When you die, your title. Your character, God of Satan, I am not a professor and so you know. That does not matter anywhere. So people create these, these things in their minds and they create this prejudice which influences the theology of the church in many times. Listen. The church's theology basically, in a sense, is that what? Jesus was born he grew up, he died on a cross for our sins, he was resurrected and he went back to heaven, and he's going to come back at the end. That is our theology right there. If we base our theology on the true Jesus, on the true word of God, we have no time with prejudice. Amen? And hypocrisy doesn't raise only head. You see, because of prejudice, hypocrisy follows. Because we like to pretend. People like to pretend. They are prejudiced, but they want to pretend that they like certain things. But they don't. Hypocrisy comes into play. And it will corrupt the theology that you have. So when we say... There was an article some time ago. Uh, somebody wrote a secular person. He's, he's not a... He forms a Christianity. But he was commenting, he said this to me. Christians don't live by their own Bible. They don't live by what they say in there. He says Christians hate people. They steal, they cheat. They don't love anybody. They don't live by their own Bible. They don't live by their own code. And that is a very damaging statement that has been made from a secular humanist who is totally against the word of God and Bible. Because the Bible says that they will know you, or they will know me rather, by the love you have for one another. Is it that people are not responding to Jesus because they're not seeing the love in the Christian church? They're not seeing that love we have to share together. They're not seeing that, so therefore they're not responding to Jesus. You know, responding to the church, right? They don't see the love. Uh, people are, you know, busy trying to evangelize and so on. But when they evangelize, what are they coming to church to find? That's the question. <laughs> Listen, the, the way people evangelize now, just get numbers in the church. That is not evangelism. When you evangelize, it's not to bring some of the church, you know. To tell them Jesus Christ. If they come to your church, fine. But you're not going to evangelize and bring them to your church. You know? You're going to evangelize and tell Jesus Christ. That's what we are crucified back in the day. So, when we say evangelism, it's not to tell you come to a church. It's to tell you about Jesus Christ. Because why? That's the picture of evangelism we have over the years. People evangelize because the church uses numbers. So evangelists get more numbers to the church. That is not evangelism. People come to your church because the Holy Ghost draws them. People will come here and we never evangelize them at all because they come from some place we didn't even know about. We never saw them before. But who drew them? 
the Holy Ghost shows them. So we don't increase the numbers in our churches. The Holy Ghost does that. Right? It is his church. But we evangelize to win souls for Christ, not to win souls for opening our center. Right? Because when you win souls for Christ, you are wise according to the will of God. Right? So we have to ensure that we don't corrupt our theology by listen to me. Huh? We all have our own little prejudice inside of us. Right? We all have little prejudice inside of us. Now we have to look at continually and see whether or not that prejudice in us is 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 is, is creating a problem in our lives, and we have to look at that. And you know, that is why every day there must be some introspection. We have to look at ourselves and see where we are. Lord, where am I? Where, where are we? Where am I with you? You know, we have to look at ourselves inside there and see where we are. Because sometimes we can be walking in sin and even realize that we are. So we have to look to God to help us with that. So we all have all the prejudice inside of us that we have to look at. But I guess the one prejudice we should have is prejudice against sin. That's the one prejudice that against sin. Totally hates sin. Totally hates sin. And the prejudice against that anything that's sinful, and, and you know, we are against that kind of thing. Yeah? So listen, let's look at look at what Peter would have done here. What is a man on board? But I get you. As some of us in that times, as we all do that times. And but that urn was that urn was significant because he's a senior apostle in the body of Christ. He's a senior apostle. And in erring, he would have caused the people under him to follow those Judeans, Judeans as well, and feel that Gentile Christians must follow Jewish law. To be Christians. So when we as Christians, senior persons in the faith, when we make those kind of fundamental errors, it creates problems for those who follow us. Because that was a theological error. Very much so. And that those errors must not be had. We must always refine our theology on the word of God. Always refine our theology there on the word of God. Because the word of God is the astic by which we measure all theology. If anything, how small it is, does not line up with the word of God, throw it aside. Because then it, it is not what we need to adhere to. Because then it's outside of the theology of the Bible. Amen? So, let us take some time and look at it ourselves. Look at our own prejudices that we have and see whether we ourselves are, are creating problems that should not be there. And we see whether or not that we in the church, if we are, if we cause not us a fault and we cause our own kind of prejudice, that creates a purpose in our theology. Let's, let's look at that. Because that is important to know, it's important to realize. Because in doing so, and looking at ourselves, we will realize and acknowledge I need Jesus more and more every single day of my life. Listen, I still about just today. I have been serving God since I was eight years old. But today, I need him more even than I did need him then. So I can't give up Jesus now. I can't. I need him more and more every single day. Because I am seeing where it is easy to step away from and to falter from God and step into your own thing. It is easy. There's a thin line, you know. There was a song. There's a thin line between love and hate. There's a thin line between sin. And, and, and holy listeners, there's a thin line between that. 
Bless you. And we have to be so careful of that. So we have to look at ourselves every day and see where we are. And don't do like that Pharisee. And focus on and say, look, I am, I am not like this man over here. I'm not like those people over there. You know, they might just be like a child. You don't have to, but just, just like, they might be even worse than a man. Because the Bible says, he says here in Luke, he says, for everyone who exhausts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Too many Christians are exalting themselves. And God has to humble them. But the problem is, people don't like the process of humbling. You see, Christianity is a process. Eh? It's a process. Humility is a process you have to move through. If you're not going to have to go through that process, then God can't use you. As simple as that. God can use you. Some people are unfulfilled in church by it because God can use them. They're too arrogant. God can use you. You might be gifted, they're based on arrogance. And God is not only gifted, He gave it to you. The Bible says the gifts and call of God and to repent the meaning, He will not take it back. But if you are arrogant, God is not in there anymore. That is just you and the human charisma that's working, but God is not in that gift anymore. If you give me two persons, one who's a superb singer, but arrogant, one, they're not so good, but the humble or willing to learn, I will take the second one. The first one, go on to know. You can sing here, yeah, we'll go on to know. The area from the street, yes. Ministry is not arrogance. Ministry is humility. That is the key to living in Jesus Christ in humility. The Bible says Jesus was humble even to death on the cross. There's a song that says he really didn't have to die, though. Know? It is true. He didn't have to die if he didn't want to, you know. But he chose to give his life because why? He was humble to the Father's request. Humility is one of our keys to success in our Christian world. Humility. And these are Jesus' words in Luke. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. If you exalt yourself, bet your bottom dollar for you to be humble. I have seen people of their organizations all puffed up and, and, and so on against other people. And one day, they got demoted and that person became their superior. Where you going to do that? That's always the case. In my own instance, uh, going up with a job and so on, People simply spies me and like me at all. They have not been, they are not retired. They have come to go off I charge now. They have come to me now. I decide what I will do, what I wouldn't do. But more often than not, I won't treat them bad. But I've made them so far away. It's kind of made them take far away just to you know, make them feel as though, you know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, because it's not in me to, to treat people evil and bad. I can't do that, you know. Well, listen, what if you make a fasten? It's a nice thing. I can't do that. You can't be here, son. You can't fix it one time. So you, you, I can't do it. You just get over here. I'm stretch from it. Stretch from it. I won't treat it poorly. But here's some point of that course. There was one. That time I was in the airport. You see, that guy used to really as if. He born and he woke with his own. Every little thing. We have charged somebody 4.5 meters of power. I said, hey, that would be some big man. That would no sense. I never did it. But shortly thereafter, he retired. He imported a vehicle. But he didn't get to be before he retired. 
So the Jews came after he retired. And he came to the section to deal with his redemptment. Everybody passed him straight. He was a kind of person. People see him, yeah, they didn't want to be at all. They leave him out there. Like, especially about him. He won't want ask him no questions. I saw it. I said, what did he mean to me? So I turned to him. I said, fine. I'll help you get him. I did it for him. He was in shock. But I'm not like you. And I would have to live like that. Because it's wrong. You can't live like that. But it's wrong to live like that. To behave in that fashion. And people transfer those things into the church as well. Those kinds of behaviors. It is wrong to behave like that. Humility is important in the house of God. It is the only way the work of God could really progress. If everyone is humble in what they are doing before the Lord. And that includes me as well. Not because I'm the pastor, I am all arrogant and up there. Listen, yesterday was so much fun. We had a double yesterday. Listen, I'm thinking, where have you seen a pastor in a short pants going to back here somewhere? That is me. Listen, with me, what is his way to get an end of story? I don't pretend to, is me. Right? I ain't go and buy no robe, no Baptist jacket to pull anything, to come in the water and feel like I'm some kind of official from somewhere. Come on, man. That water, you get heavy, the clothes get heavy in the water. They say, I'm trying to have a get to the water. But, you know, we, we left and we all went to, to eat. We're too late, we're going next time. Went to eat some doubles and so on. And, I am. I was amazed at how 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 fantastic everything was. Everything felt is. If I remember, tell the truth, I remember. You understand? Anybody want to test tomorrow? Anybody want to test tomorrow? Listen, that felt so good. I have not felt that way for a really long time, for a number of years. I felt that way in my teenage years in church. That's how long that is. I have to teach again. I have been years now, so I have to teach again. I have not felt that way for a long time in church. And I said, Lord, I am grateful that we could feel that way here. Yeah. I am, I am, I am. I am grateful. Yeah. Because everybody come out, we eat doubles, triple, what well, we triple, and okay, okay. We, 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 we bust the box, the box finish. You understand? Let's go and back for us. Yes, some doubles on from anything first. You might find a quarter and all. We don't have like doubles on the quarter. You get that too. You understand? But I, I love the company that we had and that we have rather. Because why? There's humility in the house of us. I am not your superior because I'm the boss. I'm not your superior. I am your teacher, but not your superior. So therefore, when we get together, it should be pure, holy, most fun, and that's relaxation. So ladies, enjoy yourself with doubles yesterday, I know. We all have ball doubles yesterday. We all had such a good fun. And again, I am, I am, I'm, I'm standing here, I'm getting goosebumps thinking because I haven't felt that way in a long time. I would dare say, I have not felt that way just about 30 years ago. I'll be really honest. I have not felt like that in 30 years in Muslim world. Yesterday, I mean there were other days, but yesterday was special. Because yesterday we all were together. We just did baptism, that was fantastic, that was fun. And then we left to come down to come back home and we, 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 we detoured to buy doubles and so on. And I, I just felt, it, it felt the love that was that God feels for us. I felt that love there. Amen, amen. Let me give you the testimony one time as well, but you might say it. <laughs> oh, dear Christopher, <laughs> Jacqueline's movie is wonderful. Huh? <laughs> so excited for doubles. <laughs> Left the ignition on and care for doubles. But nobody realized that, eh? Until we finished the Christmas, it's going to be a key. 
you are a quality. No, they look at where the garbage went back to the car. The keys in the car, the car just started with the children out. God was good, they passed the car straight, right? Amen. And the good thing is, and the brand new car. Yeah. And you know, but God is good. You were back in that car that was air condition one time. Did you know what I But you know, God is so good. Nobody says he keeps he saw the young time. Nobody created an environment where we spoil the occasion. Everybody was just oh thank Jesus. We thank God, we thank you Lord. That this is God. This is God. And this was a point. It's about Jesus. So when you forget something, he will help you out one time. You see, your heart before God must be pure. And God has made us working things out. Because he doesn't forget the key at all. He doesn't forget us. But on this occasion, such euphoria, such excitement. I don't think it was those of those baptism too, I guess. <laughs> Was the for the whole situation, and we went there. It doubles for all the windows. The car parked up, so we are going there somewhere. We find it back there somewhere. Cars pass through the place, and the spirit of God camouflaged the car. You understand? And they came back, and the car was safe and sound. For the air conditioning, you know. You know? Listen, we thank God for all of those. Because God is the kind of God that works in a situation where if you can give your heart in, he will come through for you. So humility is important in the house of God. If you have to avoid this situation in a way, prophecy, prophecy, theology, humility in us, God is so important. It is critical to our, our further development in the house of God. Because when there's humility, God can operate as a light in the house of God. God can move in our situation, in our circumstances, because of humility. He can move in the church because of humility. He can, he can do some things. Why? Because his people have a humble heart before him. And they're willing to, to, to die to self so that he can be glorified. And that is the thing. You see, Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, died to self eh? even though he was selfless but at that juncture he made certain and put away every part of him and settled it one time there he said look he said father if this cup if it be your will let this cup pass from but nevertheless not my will what did he do there he died to self once and for all he killed himself already before he died on the cross. He killed himself right there. So he understood because he became scared. He became affected because he's going to, his father, when that sin comes upon him, he won't see his father for a few seconds and he has an eternity. He became afraid because he went to the cross and, and he knows what kind of punishment is going to be. They have to be nailed, they want to pierce his side, ram some thorns in the head and so on. So he's going to feel that. But right there in the garden, with drops of blood coming down, he died to self. He died to self. And that is important for us to know. If Jesus died to self, then we could die to self as well. And we want to. Yeah. If Jesus died to self, we could die to self as well. You are shot here in the post, but I need to see this again. For the spirit of God is going to say again to you. When, when, if the if God, Jesus, could die to self, why would we die to self as well? If Jesus, who was and is God, can die to self, why can't we die to self? Why can't you? It's not we are so full of pride in our own self and the why. Because we are like a mist, a vapor that disappears, poof, anytime. As you know, in our family experience, death is a while ago. We experienced two fathers, matter of fact, matter of 24 hours, or less than 24 hours actually. 
So we moved house on the Tuesday. She, the Wednesday, sorry. We took her to the health center. She was at mental health for spent a week inside there. She went to see her on the Saturday, on the on the Friday. She was very gone, looking weird. On the Saturday, she was gone. Just like that. She looked all alive and went on Friday. On the Saturday, she was gone. Then talking to her sister now. On the Saturday, on the same Monday, we went to get some stuff done. That same Monday, Sister Fennell went to hospital and died a few hours later. Life is fleeting. The mist disappears. Nobody planned for those two deaths to occur. We could, we could not prepare for those things. And when you experience death in that way, you look at yourself again and say, Lord, may I keep myself right with you? And may I say humble on the Almighty hand goes by. Today you're here, tomorrow you're gone. We are still up to this day. Come to terms with those two deaths. Because, like I told her, I can still hear my mother always voice in my head talking on the telephone and talking to me as well on the telephone. See, her voice is there. I can hear her voice in my head right now. See. It is difficult to come to terms with those things. But when we as the people of God behave arrogant in the place of God, where does our eternity stand? Where does humility find a place in the kingdom? So that when we as people of God don't walk home before God, what do we leave for God in our lives? Everybody says, give me, give me, give me, Lord, give me, give me, give me. That's what we say sometimes. But God says, give me your life. God says, give me everything that you have. We'll be given we give something, but not everything else. You see, to be humble under the mighty hands of God is to understand that God is in charge of everything that takes place in your life. Everything. When you wake up in the morning, I thank you, Lord, I'm awake this morning. People get up and just go. As if, well, you woke up for yourself. No, God woke you up. Because you could have died overnight. When you sleep, your spirit strays away sometimes. That may explain bad breath and so on. Because your body decays out of it. When the spirit goes, it comes back after. What if somebody dies in their sleep? When they spend after they come back, they die in their sleep. When we, when, we, when we go to bed and close our eyes, we are between life and death. So when we wake up in the next morning, thank you, Jesus. You woke us up today. I always say that every morning, thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. I say that every single day because He did. And they say, we're still talking about hypocrisy and proxenology. See, humility is the greatest component to guide against that kind of thing. Humility and forthrightness. Because we have to stand for what is right in the kingdom of God. In our church today, too many are covered or exercise covered eyes when it comes to speaking the truth of the word of God. In some place I was before, and I would minister the word of God, they told me I too hard. But I'm telling you the word of God, what the Bible says that we have to do. If that is hard, then what is it want to do? Then why are you a Christian? If it is hard to serve God, so hard to follow the Bible, then what's the point then? What's the point of you? What's the point of trying to die on the cross? If we say you have to be a Christian, you have to live for God, you have to live right. So then he died because of nothing there. We have to remember if we truly want God to, to work in our lives, he 
Humility is the key to it. An out of humility comes love. And out of love comes togetherness. And out of togetherness comes unity. And I saw such great unity yesterday. I, I was moved to tears inside of myself because of what I saw yesterday. I said, Lord, that is the kind of church I've longed for all of my life. For all of my life. I experienced it a bit when I was younger in a church that I grew up in. But when I got older and moved ahead to the churches, that was no longer there. So I yesterday I felt what I have not felt, like I said, in 30 plus years of my Christian open world. It, it has taken me a lot of self-introspection and willpower to propel myself forward in the things of God. Because many times my work with God, I had no support from anybody in the church that is. But in those times, I had to see God for myself. You have to know the God that you see. But it's unfortunate though that in the house of God, people can live such separate lives that nobody cares about anybody else. Because why? Our prejudice let hypocrisy that corrupted our theology. That must never happen in hope in your center. We must never behave with prejudice and hypocrisy and corrupt the theology of God in our lives. We must never do that. If we remember those things, our church can and will be a very big, happy family. Amen. I long, I always long to see that in the church, that there's just that love that transcends every boundary. The Bible says in, in the early church, it says those that had wealth, they saw what they had, and they brought it to this with all that had none. So everybody had something, everybody was happy together. Why have we lost that perspective? Why? Because prejudice led to hypocrisy that corrupted our theology. And we have lost sight of the real reason why we in the church. Amen? Amen. So you understand me this morning? Yes. Yes? yes. So listen. I want to see this church. One of my visions are this, because I have quite a few of them. But it's a see what your center. Be an example of love churches everywhere in this country and beyond. We must be a church that truly shows the love that God has for all of us, that we have for each other. Even if we will disagree, we will touch on that difference very quickly. And love and continue and move on. We must never hold grudges against anybody for anything. Sometimes, even if you feel wrong, sometimes you leave it alone and see what happens. You may discover that what you felt wasn't true. Yeah. Sometimes we have to attend to our own So in this church, we have to show that love. That Jesus showed his disciples. And he washed their feet. Because washing feet is an expression of love. And 
of the Son in that time. The expression goes by. He is the Lord washing the feet of his servants. So that shows great humility. And that cannot be overemphasized in the house of God. Humility. That is most important. So let, let's start. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the God that you are in our life. Lord, we ask you today to remember us, O God, at this time. As we stand before you, Jesus, Lord, we stand before you humbly today, Father. Ask you, Father, to move upon us, O God. And Lord, cause us to be the people that will seek to refrain ourselves in you, Lord. Lord, I will attend to those issues in our lives that need attention. Lord, those issues that create problems in us, which cause us to walk as we should. Help us to look in ourselves and see, Lord, what we need to do for God and ourselves. Lord, it is me standing in the need of prayer. Lord, it is me standing before you, Lord, asking you, Lord, to look in me and purge me, Father. Lord. It is not as the Bible says. Purge me, Father. Lord. Cleanse me and make me new before you, Jesus. We ask you this morning, Father. That you will do that in our lives, Father God. Cleanse us and purge us, Father God. In the name of Jesus. And God, I want to thank you for your people today, Father. Lord, as we look into ourselves where we might be and we need to be now, Father. As we ask you, Lord, to purge us, O Lord, and cleanse us, O God. And turn ourselves around. Lord, we thank you this morning. And God, you will never pass us. Yes, Lord. God, you want to heal our broken hearts. Yes, Jesus. Lord, heal us, O Lord, where we are broken inside. Strengthen us where we are weak, Father. Make us strong, Father. Yes, Lord. Stand before you. Stand before you, Lord. To give your praise, Lord. And to lift you as we should. So, Father, I thank you this morning for your people. And I pray your divine blessings upon your people today, Father. In the name of Jesus. Lord, bless your people today, Father. With tremendous blessings. Lord, open doors that have been shut for years that should be opened, Father. And Lord, close doors that need to be shut, Father, but in their lives or in our lives, Father. In the name of Jesus. Lord, may we be moved by your spirit and by your anointing. May we be moved by your direction, Father, as you lead us, Lord, into your divine pathway, Father. I thank you, Jesus, for your love upon us today, Father. And Lord, may we in turn share our love with each other, Father. And those that come up and tap with us, may they feel the love and see the love that's in us that came from you, Father. So, God, I thank you, this morning. And I give you honor and praise, Father. And God, I pray for anyone today in this house or online today, Father, that does not know your Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord. Say this up. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Of my sin. I repent of my sins. Of my sins Come into my life and make me one of you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I promise now to live for you for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. So God, as they are praying, I pray. Lord, touch their lives today. Yes, Lord. Cause them to see to the wrong in their lives, Father. And may they come to you now. And serve you all their lives, Father. So God, I thank you now for them and bless them today, Father. May they find a good church that it attend will lead them to the right church, Father. Yes, yes, Lord. To learn of you and to learn about you, Father. And to know, have you in their lives as their personal Savior. So God, I give you thanks for them, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord. Amen. And I thank you for your church today, Father. Yes. The congregation, online and here as well. God, as we continue to walk this walk, 
and talk this talk. May we drink with integrity, Father. Yes. And with love and humility before you. Yes, yes, Lord. And so, Lord, Father, give you thanks and give you praise, Lord, Father. Yes, Lord. For all your people today. And give you thanks for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And people say, Amen. Amen and amen. amen. So, thank you, my friends, tonight. God bless you. Um, see you on Tuesday night. Please, the Lord, for Revelation at 7 o'clock. So, bless you. Have a good week. Till that's another good night. Take care.